Welcome to the Blessed Michael McGivney Pilgrimage Center's virtual Christmas tour presentation, The Nativity Story, Art of the Crèche. My name is John Erickson, and I will be your guide as we explore how the story of the birth of Jesus Christ has been told across the globe through art. Where might you see a nativity scene? Take a moment and think. Perhaps in a church, inside your home with other Christmas decorations, or on the town green or in a town park. Especially around Christmas, creches are found all over. These nativity scenes show us what we read and hear in the Bible, a book with a universal message. But while the story comes from one book, our created is diverse, often bringing in parts of local life. Many parts featured in these artworks are told about in two of the four Gospels, the Gospels of Luke and Matthew. Additional details are often also added, including changes to the settings, time periods, landscapes, the inclusion of different animals, and the presence of different characters at Christ's birth. This presentation shares many examples from our collection, showing how the nativity has been depicted in paintings, iconography, and sculpture. Throughout the presentation, I will refer to some nativity scenes as a creche, which is a three-dimensional representation of the story. We start our exploration with the Christ child, for without him there is no nativity story and no Christian religion. The nativity story is found within the first two chapters of both the Gospels of Luke and Matthew, although each Gospel speaks about the story very differently. But even before the telling of his nativity story, the Bible includes verses that predict Christ's coming. This Bible verse from Isaiah not only predicts Jesus' birth, but provides some of the nicknames he's been called over time, such as Wonder Counselor and Prince of Peace. The nicknames also show the importance of Christ to the world and to all humans. In this painting of the Christ child from Mexico, he is not a baby, but instead a young boy. In it, there are three ways the meaning of his birth is shown. Around his head is a glowing halo. It not only reminds us of Jesus' holiness, but also St. Bridget's vision of the infant Christ having a heavenly glow. Second, his eyes are looking upward toward God the Father, understanding his place as Son of God. Finally, his hand is shown in the position of blessing. Take a moment now to make that hand gesture with two fingers bent and the other three straight. You may see a priest also make the same hand gesture when he is given the blessing of the cross at the beginning and the end of Mass. For the Christ child in this painting, his hand is in blessing next to a blue sphere which could represent the earth. When thought about together, it could mean that Christ is blessing us, a reason why he was born. In a different way, this crush from Japan with wood-carved figurines dressed in traditional Japanese clothes also shows Christ's part in the nativity story and to humanity. While all those standing have eyes curved down to look at the Christ child in quiet prayer, his eyes are painted curving up. Here is a closer look at his eyes. Not only does it let him look at those around him, but his upward-looking eyes let his gaze see all who look upon the nativity scene. Together, his eyes and smiling face show that Christ came to save us all and provide us a path to heaven. For Jesus, the Son of God, to become human, he needed to be born just like any other baby with a mother bearing a child. Chosen by God for that special job was Mary, the story of her learning of the coming of her son Jesus is only told about in the Gospel of Luke and begins the nativity story. In the story, the angel Gabriel visits Mary to tell her that God, in his love for Mary, is going to give her a baby who is also God's son. Although first unsure, Mary believes Gabriel because of her full faith in God and accepts this good news as a gift from God. Known as the Annunciation, this word means the announcement to Mary that she was going to become the mother of Christ. The story of the Annunciation is found in many art forms, including this icon from Russia. 
Catholics and Orthodox Christians use icons as part of their prayer and worship. This icon includes elements with a special meaning connected to the Annunciation story. Mary's hand is pointing towards a book. The text in the book is probably from Isaiah. It tells another prediction of Christ's birth in that God will give a sign of a pregnant young woman who will bear a son named Emmanuel, which means God is with us in Hebrew, the language of the Jewish people. The icon also shows rays of light piercing through the clouds at the upper left, meant to show God is with Mary and that this news is a blessing from him. We later hear in both Gospels that Mary gives birth to her son and names him Jesus. But over the history, how she looks in the nativity scene has changed. This crash from Ghana by Mohammed Amin shows Mary lying down on a striped blanket with the Christ child beside her. For the first thousand years in art, Mary was usually depicted like this, showing her tiredness after giving birth. Have you seen another nativity scene where Mary is lying down? Or perhaps you've seen her kneeling with her hands either together or crossed on her chest. Both those hand positions remind us of her devotion to God and her son, one in the same. Another way Mary is shown with her newborn son is as a mother. In this sculpture of Mary and the Christ child, the focus is upon a mom holding her love and her life her son. This way of seeing Mary, both on its own and within the nativity scene, makes it relatable to us and situations we might have had as a baby or a child ourselves. In addition to Jesus and Mary, nativity scenes include Mary's husband and the foster father of Christ, Joseph. Together, they make the Holy Family. Like Mary, Joseph was very faithful to God as we see here in these Bible verses from Matthew, that first tell of his future marriage to Mary. This is also the only place in the Bible where we hear about Joseph's dream about Mary becoming Jesus' mother. Once he has the dream, Joseph believes that the Christ child is a gift from God and is also willing to do what God asks. He also understands that as a husband, he must protect, care for, and be faithful to his family of Mary and her son. The Holy Family is, of course, a popular subject in religious art, and at times they are shown without the rest of the nativity story. Such as in this painting. In it, the Holy Family is most likely shown shortly after the nativity story, for Christ is not in the manger. It shows Joseph, Mary, and Jesus as a family, and what is a family for them? Similar to the mother and child sculpture, Mary holds Jesus. Her focus is on her son with her head tilted down towards him, and she holds him securely in her lap, keeping him safe. Joseph sits slightly behind the mother and child with his head lowered in worship. His one hand is raised in the position of blessing, while the other is placed on his chest to show respect. This painting also tells us again about what Jesus means to us. Light radiates from around his head as a sign of holiness. Christ also holds something in his one hand. What do you think it is? What might it mean? The Christ child holds an apple, reminding us of the story of Adam and Eve eating the apple. This is another way to show that Jesus came to save us all and give us a path to heaven by wiping away this original sin of Adam and Eve. In contrast, this nativity from Peru shows Mary and Joseph both kneeling in prayer over the newborn Christ. Their vibrant, colorful clothing with its geometric patterns is traditional to the South American country and is still made and worn by Peruvians today. Mary and Joseph's prayer might be for many things, being thankful of Christ's birth as a parent, feeling God's blessing, being thankful to God, and understanding that Jesus is the Son of God. As we look at another artwork featuring the Holy Family, let's take a moment to consider further how Joseph is shown in this art. Since the Bible never tells how old Joseph is, he is sometimes shown as an older man, as in the painting from Italy, 
or younger as in the last crash from Peru. In both the previous nativity scenes, Joseph is shown in prayer, which could also be seen as his fatherly concern toward the Christ child. In this play from Norway, Joseph is shown again in prayer, but before him sits a lantern on the ground. The appearance of the lantern connects to St. Bridget's vision of the birth of Christ. In the Bible, it tells that the birth occurred at night when it was dark and at a time where there were no electric lights. In St. Bridget's vision, Joseph brought a lighted candle so that they could see. Once the Christ child was born, Joseph was able to put the lantern down because the place where the birth took place was filled with a heavenly light that completely outshone the earthly light of Joseph's candle. Sometimes this heavenly light comes from Jesus, who many years later would go on to say in John's Gospel, I am the light of the world. In this plate, though, it is the geometric and large star above the Christ child that is the heavenly light. In this plate, where does the Christ child lay? In the next part of the nativity story, we will look at now. In the Bible, we hear that Mary and Joseph were traveling when Christ was born. Not at home, they were in Bethlehem, and many other travelers were there as well. For Joseph and Mary, they arrived in Bethlehem and were unable to find a place to stay the night. As this story tells, Joseph and Mary had to stay in a stable. In the Gospel of Luke, we hear at Mass, though, it says a little less, mentioning only Jesus being placed in the manger. What is a manger? It is a container used to place food for animals to eat, such as horses, donkeys, and cows. Many often think that because a manger is for animals to eat, that should mean that Jesus' birth was in a stable. But a stable today is very different than what was used in Jesus' time. Most stables of Jesus' day were caves. Like we see here in this crash from Italy, in front of the cave backdrop we see Jesus, but rather than in a manger, we see him surrounded by a white blanket. Most likely, this is his swaddling clothes that are mentioned in Luke's Gospel. Swaddling is used to keep baby's arms and legs close to the body so that they stay warm and safe. Many nativity scenes use an open front setting that's more typical of a stable we see today. This building looks similar to a modern day stable, but do you see the differences? It has multiple floors, an animal at right in the stable is an elephant, and Jesus' manger is hanging. This stable depicts traditional homes found in the villages of Laos. Many of the houses in the Southeast Asia country are made of bamboo or other wood, have thatched roofs, and are built on top of timber stilts to protect the floors from mud during the rainy season. While this structure is native to the artist's homeland, other countries create even more out-of-the-box stables and use special materials. One material that's used as a stable in multiple places around the world is a gourd. Can you eat a gourd? What is the difference between a gourd, squash, or even a pumpkin? There are small differences between the three, but they are, in fact, members of the same plant family. A gourd is for display, a squash for cooking, and a pumpkin for cooking or carving. This nativity scene in a gourd is from Peru, where gourd carving is a 4,000-year-old art form. Once the design is carved into the gourd, the artist will burn the outside portions of it to show shades of brown. For this gourd, it has decoration on the outside and was cut open and hollowed so that the nativity scene made of clay figures could be shown. Other places where a gourd is used include Kenya in Africa, where they also carve the outside, but instead fill the inside with figures made from natural materials such as corn husks and bark. A gourd was even used as this nativity setting in Arizona right here in the United States, where the figures inside are similar to the figures from Peru. Although a little hard to see, behind the cow and donkey sits the Christ child on hay. 
many see that Jesus laying in the manger reminds us of the sacrament of the Eucharist, where he is spiritual food given up for us. Unique to Germany, this crèche holds a nativity story in a pyramid. It's called a Krippen Pyramida, or Nativity Pyramid in German. Can you say Krippen Pyramida? Repeat after me. Krippen Pyramida. Krippen Pyramida. Now you know a German word. They range in size from miniature displays to gigantic structures that tower over the stalls of Christmas markets in Germany. In this creche, the Holy Family are on the bottom level and other levels have figures also as part of the nativity story. Do you wonder why there's a propeller at the top? It's because this is a moving nativity scene. Each level of figure sits on a turntable connected to the propeller. When the candles around the bottom are lit, the rising heat makes the fan blades move, turning the propeller and all the levels below, allowing you to see the figures and bringing the scene to life to be seen over and over and over again. This short video of another Crippen Pyramida shows it turning and the different levels of figures up close. This fantastic nativity scene was made in the country of Poland in Europe, next to Germany. It's known specifically as a Szapka Krakowska because it's from the city of Krakow. But for short, it's just called a Szapka. Can you say Szapka? Repeat after me, Szapka. Not only do you know German, but also a Polish word. What does this building look like? A church, or maybe even a castle. It looks this way because it's made up of elements found in the historic castles and churches of Krakow. And it's made of materials you probably have at home. Cardboard, aluminum foil, paper, and wood. Since 1937, there's a national Shopka competition every year in Krakow's main square on the first Thursday in December. People in Poland make this kind of nativity scene because they see Christmas not only as a historical event that occurred over 2,000 years ago, but something that occurs every year. If the Christ child were born today, the Polish people believe he should not be placed in a manger, but instead in a bed with a home fit for King of Kings. But where is the Christ child? The large size of the building hides the figures which can be found at the top of the steps. We will next look at how angels are seen in the nativity scenes. Angels work for God, serving as protectors and guides for humans, and servants bringing news from God to those on earth. They are a big part of the story before Jesus' birth, bringing news of Mary's pregnancy and telling Joseph to keep his wife safe and with him. Angels also serve as protectors after the birth of Christ, warning the Magi not to tell Herod about where the Christ child is and telling Joseph to flee to Egypt to keep Jesus safe. Angels appear in both gospel stories of the birth of Christ. In Luke's gospel, angels also bring the news of Jesus' birth to the shepherds near Bethlehem. As this story tells, first there is one angel that announces the news, and then many more angels came to praise God. Some nativity scenes show the first angel, and others show lots of angels. This crash is from Sicily, which is part of Italy. The artist, Angela Trippi, decided to include only one angel, who holds a banner that reads Gloria, a Latin word that means glory or glory to God. The movement of the angel's clothes was created by dipping the clothing in a watered-down glue. While it is still wet, the artist folds and places the clothing. As it dries, the folds stay in place, making it feel like the angel is in the air with the breeze and flying. In this creche, the angel looks down on the shepherd, wise men, and holy family, making this a moment after it told the shepherds of Jesus' birth. Different from the angel in the Italian nativity, 
This angel has its hands together in prayer. The angel brings blessings from God on the Holy Family and Magi, and the angel's placement hovering above the others might be in protection to those below, especially the Holy Family. The figurines in this nativity scene wear clothing similar to the traditional dress of the Central American country of El Salvador, where this creche was made. The vibrant colors are a joyful representation, and today, this clothing is still worn during the celebrations including festivals and other religious events. Unlike the last two creches, this nativity scene has a lot of angels doing many different things. The figures are based on the drawings of Sister Maria Innocencia Hummel, who drew everyday scenes of children in the countryside of Germany where she lived. This creche was collected by one priest over the years. To praise God and Christ's birth, many of the angels he collected are playing instruments. What instruments do you see? Guitar, violin, flute, and trumpet are all being played in celebration. Other angels in the creche hold candles and even a lantern, reminding us again that the birth happened at night. Earlier we heard about angels appearing first in the nativity story to tell of Christ's birth, but do you remember who they were telling? After Jesus' birth, only the Gospel of Luke tells of the angels appearing to the shepherds who were watching over their animals in the fields outside Bethlehem. Upon being told the good news, they left the fields and found the Christ child. After meeting him, the Bible tells that they went to spread the news of Jesus' birth to others. But according to the folklore of one country, the story of one female shepherdess continues not with telling others the news, but with the Holy Family. In this hand-carved cedar crest from Mexico created by Augustine Para, we see this woman shepherd gesturing protectively at the Christ child along with the man shepherd at the left. Standing at over three feet high, these shepherds and the other standing figures are roughly half the height of an adult. The shepherdess's gesture may refer to the folktale told of a shepherdess who played the role of a protectress. Her story unfolds with her presence at Christ's birth and again when she accompanies the Holy Family during their flight into Egypt. While not a part of the original Bible story, this story has been passed through generations giving further meaning to those who visited Jesus in the manger. The shepherds in our nativity collection relate not only to folklore, but also... Wait a second! Now we've just had a minor celebrity sighting. Have you ever watched Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer during this time of year? When Rudolph runs away, he meets his friend Yukon Cornelius, who is exploring the Arctic looking for gold and silver. Well, it seems Yukon, with his distinct mustache, has joined this Hungarian nativity scene by Catalan Moldvoy as a shepherd. The figure at the left has the same hair color and wears a cap just like Yukon and reminds me of that classic holiday movie. Unlike the winter hiking gear Yukon wears in the movie, this figure wears clothing similar to the traditional clothing from Hungary. So where was I? Oh, yes. The shepherds in our nativity collection not only relate to folklore, but also connect to our understanding of Jesus. Nativity scenes often include shepherds with their flock of animals, including this creche from Spain that includes two shepherds holding sheep, one in their arm and one over their shoulders. Let's look for a moment at the shepherd holding the sheep on his shoulders. Why might he be holding the sheep? because he was tired, or maybe even hurt, and thus could not walk on his own to the manger. Whatever the reason, their appearance at the birth of Christ is a sign of the future, when Christ, as an adult, calls himself the Good Shepherd. Christ does not tend sheep, but rather us, watching over and protecting us like a shepherd his sheep. It reminds us that this baby at the center of the scene will go on to have an important life. As we talked briefly before, the shepherds were in the fields watching over their animals. The nativity story we hear at church says that they were tending over their flocks. 
But nowhere in the Bible's telling of the birth of Christ does it say what animals, if any, were at his birth or came afterward. But almost always there are animals featured in nativity scenes, such as ox or cows, donkeys and sheep. Why might they be present? Since Jesus was laid in the manger, that feeding container for animals, artists think that there must be animals nearby who would normally eat the hay. Hay is a common food eaten by cattle, horses, donkeys, goats, and sheep. So thus, why they might be there. Oxen or cows and donkeys might also appear in nativity scenes because of this quote from the book of Isaiah. But what does this quote mean? If you have a pet at home, they know who you are and that you take care of them, giving them love, food, and a home. For this care, our pets love us no matter if we are good or bad. But at times, we all forget that we are like our pets in our relationship with God. God knows us and takes care of us just like we do for our pets. God also loves us when we are good or when we sin. The Bible verse, along with the cow and donkey in this example nativity scene from Belize, are a reminder to the viewer that our faithfulness to God can always improve. The cow and the donkey in this crash, along with the holy family and angel figures, may look good enough to eat because they are made of bread dough. Mazapan, or bread dough in Spanish, is formed and painted before left to dry in order to create figures such as the ones we see here. Now you've learned another word in a different language. Animals in the nativity scene might also be based on where in the world the artwork was made, such as this crash from Kenya. While a donkey appears in this scene at right, this African nativity scene includes elephants, a hippo, and even a giraffe visiting the birth of Christ. For those from Kenya, the inclusion of these animals remind them that this universal story told around the world could have also occurred in their backyard rather than in the faraway city of Bethlehem. Another animal found in many nativity scenes is the rooster. In this scene from Portugal, he perches on top of Christ's manger with other birds. People who speak Spanish or Portuguese might include a rooster because they call midnight mass at Christmas the rooster mass. In these cultures, there's a legend that a rooster who was present at the nativity announced in a human voice the news of Christ's birth letting others know just like the shepherds and angels did. The rooster in this crash sits on the middle stair of this three-step throne surrounded by the magi above, the holy family on either side, and the shepherds in a setup found in religious shrines used in Portuguese festivals. The dove is also a bird sometimes found with a nativity scene. It is used as a symbol in the Christian faith and also can sometimes be found within a crash or depictions of the Holy Family, such as this painting from Mexico where it hovers over the Holy Family. All four Gospels mention the Holy Spirit taking the form of a dove at the baptism of Jesus. And in art, the dove often represents the presence of the Holy Spirit. Additionally, a dove carrying an olive branch is a symbol of inner peace or world peace. The last animal we will look at is the camel. Camels also appear often in nativity scenes, such as in the left scene of this triptych, or three-part artwork from Vietnam. Camels are used like horses to transport humans. They can travel as fast as horses, but unlike horses, they can endure long periods of time without food or water. In the area of the world where Jesus was born, there are deserts, where the land is dry and has no plants, making the camel a great animal to travel around with. In this nativity scene, the Magi ride camels toward the Holy Family and shepherds who appear in the right two panels. Camels also appear with the Magi in our next nativity scene. As this nesting doll and the triptych shows, the Magi were travelers who also came to visit the infant Christ. They're only mentioned in the nativity story from the Gospel of Matthew. Unlike the shepherds who were nearby, the Magi journeyed a long distance to see the baby Jesus. The story never explains, though, if they walked 
or used animals to get to the baby, which is why we see them sometimes with camels or even horses. But what is a Magi? The Magi have been called by many other names over time, with this story using the name wise men. Other names include sages, diviners, priests, and even kings. No matter what the name, what is special about them is that they knew the stars in the sky and were able to see the sign of a new star. Following the star, they traveled to the Christ child and once there, prayed and gave him gifts. With little description in the Bible about the Magi, artists have often over time depicted them in different ways. As we see in the center nesting doll from Russia, it shows them on their journey not yet arrived at their destination. But if you look closer at the men, there appear to be different ages. The one in front is older with a white beard. Often, artists depicted them to be of different ages to show the stages of life, young adulthood, middle age, and old age. In Russian, Matryoshka means nesting doll. Can you say Matryoshka? Repeat after me, Matryoshka. From their clothing, it's hard to tell if these magi are sages or even kings. But it is clear in this crest from Puerto Rico that the magi are being represented as kings with their crowns. Beginning as early as 1800 years ago, they were understood as kings by some Bible readers in connection to another prediction, this time from the Psalms in the Bible. It tells of kings bringing gifts to the Son of God when he comes. In the verse, it even tells where the kings are from, Tarshish, Sheba, and Seba. Returning to the Nativity story, the Gospel of Matthew does not say how many magi follow the star to the Christ child. While all the examples seen today have three wise men, early artwork of the Nativity varies on the number included, with some having upwards of 12 to mirror the 12 apostles of Jesus. But Pope Leo the Great decided that if there were three gifts mentioned in the story, probably only three magi visited. Since Pope Leo decided that over a thousand years ago, three wise men have been depicted in the art of the nativity. Do you remember what those three gifts were? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Each gift had a special meaning, gold for Jesus' kindliness, frankincense for Christ's godliness, and myrrh for his humanity. But depending on where in the world the nativity scene is made, the gifts might differ. Such as this crèche made by Chris Teller of the Isleta Pueblo. The gifts from the Bible have been replaced with gifts such as food to feed Joseph and Mary during their first days as being parents and the blanket, an item gifted to many mothers at a baby shower or after the birth of their child. Teller's figures, including the Magi, are made with open, circular mouths in the style known as a storyteller or singing mother. Since the language of the indigenous people of North America does not have a written form, history and tradition was and continues to be passed down by it being told. These figures capture that ritual in pottery. The art form that is in its decorative patterns is the closest to a written language for the Native Americans of the Southwest United States. Other unique gifts include one gift included in the next nativity from Haiti. Then the Magi here opened their treasures and offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and pineapple. This once highly valued fruit grown in the mountainous regions of Haiti, replaces one gift traditionally brought by the Magi in this metal nativity scene. Hand hammered and crafted from repurposed metal drums, this nativity comes from an area within the Haitian capital of Port-au-Prince, known for its metal art. Now that we've looked at the elements of the nativity story and art separately, we will look at one crash that includes everything discussed previously. This final nativity scene we will look at today is the largest in our collection. From Italy, it is known as the Neapolitan Creche and contains over 150 figures, including over 80 people and over 60 animals, which were all made by members of one family who each have specific roles in creating the scene. 
you might wonder, with all those pieces, how does it get put together for exhibit? As this time-lapse video shows from when we put up this nativity scene last year, it takes several people hours just to place every person, animal, and accessory in the scene. That doesn't even include building the base it sits on or placing the larger buildings and structures before those smaller figures and pieces can be installed. Thankfully, every item has a specific place it goes that is noted down in photos so that helps us to put up and take down the crash when it's displayed. This video also begins to show how large the nativity is, for when placing the figures, you can see that we need to use ladders and can even climb into the scene. Even upon completion each year, its size is amazing and shocks many visitors. Here's a photo of me giving a tour to a group of Girl Scouts last year, which helps you again to see the size of the nativity scene. No matter how long you look at it, you always see something new. Although we cannot walk around it this year, we have the advantage of seeing close-up photos of many of the parts of the nativity story within the Neapolitan. This one photo shows every part of the story I've spoken about throughout the presentation the Christ child, Mary, the Holy Family, the manger, the angels, the shepherd, the animals, the magi, plus more. What other sorts of figures do you see in the scene? How would you describe them? What are they doing? Pause the video for a moment and look closely at the scene. And when you are ready, select play to continue. The Magi, similar to the nesting dolls from Russia, represent the three ages of men, but they do not stand together and are each shown in a different way. As a traveler just arriving to the Holy Family in the photo on the right, in amazement just behind the Holy Family and in kneeling prayer and praise at the Christ child's side in the photo on the left. Mary appears sitting beside her son, whose light is captured in the radiant rays of his halo and crown that surrounds his head. The shepherds not only appear watching over their animals, as we see in the picture on the left, but the Neapolitan also shows the moment the angel announces the birth to them, as seen in the picture at right. But as we have already noticed, this Neapolitan crush contains so much more than just the nativity story from the Bible. Also included is a full band proclaiming in song the birth of Christ, as well as people at market stands, dancing, playing cards, and eating. Beginning nearly 500 years ago, Sincagetan began to include figures in the nativity that represented the daily lives of local people and customs of Neapolitan society. This opened the door to the diverse nativity scenes we have seen today, filled with clothing, animals, and traditions of each artist's own culture. So as you celebrate Christmas this year and look at movies, books, wrapping paper, greeting cards, and more that represent the holiday, notice how each one is different. But also, notice how these differences do not take away from the universal story and meaning of Christ's birth. Thank you for spending some time today learning about the art of the Nativity Story. To learn more about the Pilgrimage Center and its offerings, please visit michaelmcgivneycenter.org. On behalf of the blessed Michael McGivney Pilgrimage Center, I wish you and yours a merry and blessed Christmas.